Here in section 2.1, we begin a new topic and we're going to talk about functions with a constant rate of change. And the new thing here is um, this idea here, that we have a constant rate of change. We've talked about average rates of change before, but the ones that we've looked at in a function, the rates of change um, change depending on what interval we're looking at. But uh, we start at the beginning here and we look at really basic functions where the constant rate of change or where the average rate of change is the same number everywhere. Now that we know what a function is, we've spent a lot of time talking about the definition of a function and looking at examples, we're going to spend the whole rest of the semester talking about um, six major types of functions. So imagine for a minute that we have a shelf um, and on this shelf we're going to put uh, different functions that we're going to learn throughout this semester. So this will be our library of functions. And the first to go on our shelf is a group of functions called linear functions. After linear functions, we're going to see a group of functions called quadratic functions. And then we extend that idea to a set called polynomial functions. So already we will have, we will have three major types of functions and we're going to have three more. The next type of function we talk about are rational functions. And when you see the word ratio, you think probably of fractions. So you can start to imagine what those are going to be like. And then probably our most important function type that we talk about are exponential functions. These will have a lot of applications, real world applications that are important. You'll see these types of functions again and again um, later in calculus. So exponential functions. And then sort of a buddy to exponential functions are logarithmic functions. And so these are the six type, major types of functions that we'll see this semester. And we'll begin with linear functions. We start with linear functions. And the first example we're going to look at is having or has to do with the price of a cheeseburger. Here's our first example. Cheeseburgers at In-N-Out cost $2.40. Produce a model for total cost as a function of cheeseburgers bought. Okay, so our job here is to produce a model. So another word for model is produce a function for total cost as a function of number of cheeseburgers bought. So this phrase here we've seen before as a function of, and we remember that when we see that, um, the thing that comes before the phrase is the output. So total cost as a function of, and here we have our input number of cheeseburgers bought. Okay, I need to produce a model. In other words, I need to come up with a formula. And my favorite way to do this is to, I can't just, usually I can't just pull the formula out of my head. So I produce a table to kind of wrap my head around how this data is behaving. And then from the table, I usually um, can tell what the formula should be. So in our table, we always put um, input values first and then output values. And so I know my inputs are number of cheeseburgers bought, and I'm going to call that variable n for number. And total cost is my output, and we'll call that c. So I think about, okay, what if I buy zero cheeseburgers? How much will that cost? That'll cost zero dollars. What if I buy one cheeseburger? I know that costs two dollars and forty cents. Two cheeseburgers will be four dollars and eighty cents. Um, three cheeseburgers, let's see, four eighty plus two forty, that'll be seven twenty. Four cheeseburgers. Um, it's nine sixty. I could keep going, but I definitely see um, the pattern that we want. So. Um, cost as a function of number of cheeseburgers is just however many cheeseburgers you have times two dollars and forty cents or 2.4 we've done what they asked us to do we produced a model for the total cost as a function of the number of cheeseburgers bought we're going to dive a little deeper into this example and look at average rates of change if i want to find the average rates of ad, average rate of change between these two data points, I take the difference of the outputs over the difference of the inputs. And I get 2.40 minus 0 over 1 minus 0. And that number becomes 
2.4 over 1, which equals just 2.4. And the units will be, let's see, it'll be the cost units, which is dollars over the N units, which is um, number of cheeseburgers. So the average rate of change is $2.4 per cheeseburger. Let's find um, just a couple other di different rates of change, average rates of change in this function. So I'm going to take a look at the rate, the average rate of change between these two data points and the difference of the outputs over the difference of the input inputs will give me. Okay, it actually gave me the exact same thing, $2.4 per cheeseburger. We'll do just one more right here. And we actually get, um, when we take the difference of the outputs over the difference of the inputs, we get equals $2.4 per cheeseburger again. So this is something that we're seeing for the first time, that wherever we take an average rate of change in this function, we're ending up with the same number. And this is the idea between, behind a constant rate of change, that you have a function that anywhere you take a rate, an average rate of change in that function, you're getting the same exact rate of change, the same exact number. And when you graph these, what do these look like? Well, with a constant rate of change, they all look like straight lines. So every average rate of change in this function is 2.4. Wherever we look, that's what we're going to find. So we have what's called a constant rate of change. The average rate of change stays the same. It's constant. And whenever we're in this situation, this is what's called a linear function. I'm going to use the last teeny tiny bit of my area here to draw um, a graph of this function, and we'll see that it is a straight line. That's why it's called a linear function. And in the graph of this function, my horizontal axis will always be my input variable. So n is the number of cheeseburgers. And on my vertical axis, I'll always have my output variable. So there I'm going to have total cost. And in this function, if I buy one hamburger, it's 240. Two hamburgers will be 480. Three hamburgers, 720. Four hamburgers, 960. And I can keep going however many hamburgers I want. So one hamburger cheeseburger will be 240, two will be 480. They're growing at the same increment each time I go up one hamburger. And that's what creates this linear function. So this is a picture of the function. And um, that average rate of ch change that was constant contributed to this totally straight line. A few things that we want to generalize from that last example, a few notes that we want to make about linear functions. So first of all, a linear function will have a constant rate of change. Next is that all linear functions, when you graph them, are straight lines. And um, I'm going to put up here that we're talking about linear functions. The third one, the third note to make, is that the constant rate of change, whatever you find, like last time we found 2.4 was the constant rate of change in the cheeseburger example. The constant rate of change is the something of the line. It's a certain characteristic that you've seen before um, that we talk about. So that constant rate of change is actually the slope of your line. This might be a good time for a brief review of things like slope-intercept form of a line and the point-slope form of a line. So there are these two very common ways of writing a line, forms of lines. The first one is called slope-intercept because you're able to read the slope and the vertical intercept or the y-intercept right off of the formula. And the second really common form is called point-slope form because it's helpful when you know the slope of a, form of a line and you know the only other information you know is a random point, not necessarily the intercept. Um, you're still able to construct an, a, a formula or an equation for that line. So let's take a look at each of these in a couple examples. So slope-intercept form will look like this. Generally, we have y equals mx plus b. And the x and the y stay put as variables. But this m is some number, and it represents your slope. And the b also will be some number, and it represents the y-intercept where um, the graph of the function hits that vertical axis. And I like to think of these two things as slope. I think of it as how it grows. In other words, if you go one unit um, on your input values, how high did your, uh, your output value go? 
for a line, it'll be the same wherever you are. Um, but the slope of a line kind of tells you how it grows. And sometimes it doesn't grow, sometimes it decreases, but still the idea that if you go, um, you know, one unit on your, on your input value, what is the output value doing each time? That's your slope. Okay. And then I think of this y-intercept as how it starts. And that's because in a, um, the y-intercept is where the line hits right here. And that is usually your, your input value is zero or how things are starting. So this number kind of tells us how the line or the function starts. And this number is going to tell us how it grows. And we'll look at some examples. Hopefully this will start to make more sense than just these abstract ideas and words. And so here's an example, or here's the form for point slope form. Again, we see our slope right here. Um, our y and our x will stay as a y and x, but now we have something called y1 and something else called x1. This is just some random point that's on the line, so we don't have the luxury of having the y-intercept this time, but any random point will still do the job. It'll still help us create the formula for this line. So m is going to be our slope, and then these two entries, x1, y1, x1, y1 is some point that's on the line. Let's look at an example. So in this example, we have a picture of the line and it looks like it goes through the points negative two, zero and zero, five. So think for a minute, um, here's the y axis and here's the x axis here. Think for a minute, which one of these is my uh, vertical intercept, my y intercept? Okay, the y-intercept is where it hits the y-axis, so this will definitely be my um, y-intercept. And um, we're going to be asked to come up with a, a formula, a, an equation for this line. And so because we're able to read off the y-intercept from the graph, we'll probably use this form of the line. We have all we need to do is find out what B is and what M is, and we're done. We found the equation for the line. We know what B is. It is, well, it's not 0, 5, it's just 5, because that's um, the point at which it hits the y-axis. So B will be 5. We do have to spend some time finding what our slope is. In slope, you've probably seen formulas for this before. It's a difference of y values over a difference of x values. You may have seen it as delta y over delta x. Essentially, we just need to um, take two random points, and we've got two points right here, and we're going to take the difference of their y values over the difference of their x values, and that'll give us the slope of a line. So difference of y values will be uh, 5 minus, and the y value here is 0, so 5 minus 0 over the difference of the x values. I have to be consistent, so I have to go back to this guy. And this x value is 0 minus negative 2.5. So 0 minus our negative 2.5. This is 5 over 2.5, which is 2. And this is our slope. Okay, we have slope and we already had our y-intercept, so we can write the um, equation for this, this line. And the equation for this line will be y equals m, and m was 2, mx plus b, and b was 5. And that's it, I've got it. So remembering these two forms of lines, we'll go on to our next example. Our next example, they ask us to find the slope, vertical, and horizontal intercepts of the line passing through 313 and 634. Okay, so this is a little more involved in the last example. Um, all we know about this line is that it passes through these two points. And it's a straight line, so um, let's see, knowing two points and knowing that we're going to have to find these three things, we definitely first need to come up with an equation for this line. That will be our first job. And when we have just two random points, um, we don't have the y-intercept. Neither of these is the y-intercept. How can I tell if something's the y-intercept? The y-intercept always starts 
with zero something because the x value is zero in the y-intercept. So neither of these is the y-intercept, which means we're probably going to use point-slope form, that second form that we talked about a minute ago. And for point-slope form, I need to know what the slope is, and I need to know a random point. I've definitely got a random point. I could use either of these. And then the slope, they didn't give me the slope, but I can find the slope using these two um, points. So I've got everything I need to find the point-slope form of this line. So let's start there. Here's the point-slope form. Uh, the, the x1 and the y1 will be no problem. I'll just fill in one of these. But let's take a minute and find the slope of the line that passes through these two points. And slope will be the difference of the y values, so 34 minus 13, over the difference of the x values, 6 minus 3. And so 34 minus 13 is 21. 6 minus 3 is 3. Seven. This is our slope right here. So with point slope form, I can start putting in the pieces that I know. I just found out that slope is 7, so let's put that in for slope. And x1 and y1, um, let's just put in for x1, so I'm going to use this point right here for my x1 and my y1. The point slope form lets you use really in any point that's on the line is legal to use. So, so my x1 will be 3, and my y1 um, is the 13. Okay, that's it. I've got um, the equation for this line. Now I just need to go back and answer all the questions that they asked me. So the slope, whoops. Let's try that again. The slope is 7, m equals 7. Uh, the next thing they ask is for me to find the vertical intercept. <coughs> now, the vertical intercept will be uh, the point on the line that crosses the vertical axis. This happens when our x is 0. I just don't know where it happens, so I need to find that y value of where it happens. Well, if x is 0, uh, let's go to our line and actually plug in 0 for x. We'll work out all these numbers, and we'll find out when x is 0, what is y. So I, I have this form for my line, and I just rewrote it, except this time I put in a 0 for x. And um, let's just see what happens here. So y minus 13 equals 7. Let's see, 0 minus 3 is negative 3. So y minus 13 equals negative 21. And then to get y by itself, I'll just add 13 to both sides. So y equals negative 21 plus 13 sounds like negative 8. This is my y-intercept. So my y-intercept is 0, negative 8. Okay, the next thing they ask us to do is find the horizontal intercept. This means when the graph of the function hits the horizontal axis. And if you think of um, a point that's hitting the horizontal axis, that means that the y value is 0. And we'll do something really similar. We'll just go back and plug 0 in for y and find out what x value that implies. So I plugged my 0 in for y just still using the same exact form for the line 0 minus 13 equals 7 x minus 3. Let's solve this for x. So let's see, on the left side we'll have um, negative 13 equals, and I'm going to multiply this out just to get rid of parentheses, 7x minus 21. And so let's go ahead and add 21 to both sides. And let's see, negative 13 plus 21 will be a positive 8 equals 7x, and divide both sides by 7, oops, and we find out that x equals 8 sevenths. And this is my horizontal intercept. So 8 sevenths 0 is where the graph is hitting 
the x-axis. And so I found everything that they asked me to do. Um, they asked me to find the slope, and I got that. Slope was 7. I found the vertical intercept. It was 0, negative 8. And I found the horizontal intercept, which was 8, 7, 0. So again, to find the, the slope, we just um, use the slope formula, and we have these two points. Of course, we had to go through some, some uh, preliminary work to find the equation for the line, because we were going to need that for the vertical and horizontal intercepts. Um, to find the vertical intercept, the key is realizing that x equals 0 for the vertical intercept. For a horizontal intercept, the key is knowing that the y value is 0 on a horizontal intercept. So let's graph this function to get an idea of um, how it looks. So here are my, my x-axis, my y-axis. Um, you know what? Knowing that the vertical intercept is negative 8, I'm going to need some room down here, so I'm going to redraw this. Okay, this is a little bit better. So vertical intercept is negative 8. One. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Here's my vertical intercept. My horizontal intercept is 8, 7, 0. That's just slightly greater than 1. And my slope is 7. So this looks pretty accurate because I know I needed a, a pretty steep slope here. Let's see if I can connect these. Okay, nope, didn't quite make it. Let's try that again. close. Okay, so this is the um, this is the graph of what our line looks like, and everything checks out. Uh, we've got a slope of 7, pretty steep slope. Uh, it hit the y-axis at 0, negative 8, and it's hitting it at the x-axis at 8, 7, 0. Um, all of this came from just knowing that two points that it went through. Let's think about, will these two points really go through this line? 1, 2, 3, 13, yeah, that's likely, and then 6, 34 is going to be way up here, and that's likely also. Our next example, we're asked to find the slope of this line, 3x plus 2y equals 12. This um, is called standard form of a line. It's neither slope-intercept or point-slope form, um, and so the slope isn't just sitting here. Uh, we can't just read it off the the equation of the line. So what our strategy here is going to be is we're going to transform this line into um, slope-intercept form and we'll be able to then read the slope off of the equation. So our strategy here is going to be take this equation that we're given of a line and put it in slope-intercept form so that we can read off the slope. So when we're done with it, we want it to look something like this, so that we can just say, oh, that number sitting with the x is the slope. And essentially what we need to do is solve this equation for y. In other words, get y all by itself on one side of the equation, and that automatically implies that it is in slope-intercept form. So we're going to take this equation of a line and um, just solve it for y. We'll get y equals something, and then it'll be in slope-intercept form. To get y by itself, um, we need to start by subtracting the 3x from both sides. So then we would have 2y equals 12 minus 3x. And then to get um, the y, <coughs> to get the 2 away from the y, we'll divide both sides by 2. <coughs> Okay, and so on the left side, these cancel. We've got what we want. We have y equals. Now on the right side, this is like 12 over 2 minus 3 halves x, and that simplifies to 6 minus 3 halves x. Okay, we're pretty close at this point. Um, it doesn't look quite like this one up here yet, because in slope-intercept form we always have the x term first, so that's no problem. We can um, easily move things around. So this will become y equals, let's put that x term first, negative 3 halves x plus 6. And so here we have 
two important pieces of information. First of all, this is our slope, that negative 3 halves, and this number here is our y-intercept. And um, they only ask for slope, so the answer to this question is, well, you, you think about this. Should the answer be negative 3 halves x, or should it just be negative 3 halves? The slope definitely equals just negative 3 halves. And the y-intercept is 6. So, um, just really quickly, if we wanted a picture of this, the y-intercept is 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So the graph is hitting right here. And um, it's going down at a rate of nick. Because of this negative, we know that it's going down at a rate of um, 3 down for every 2 over. So 1, 2, 3, 1, 2. So this would be the next point here. So the graph of this line looks roughly something like this. They didn't ask us to do this, but since this information's just sitting there so nicely, um, yeah, the line actually really goes through those points. Okay. Example five, complete the table of this linear function. We have some data for the function, and but we don't have what um, the output value for 5 is. And for this example, I'm just going to give you the strategy. You'll see some examples like this on your homework. And um, the basic strategy here is <clears throat> think through how we would solve this. Because we know it's a linear function that's really helpful, we know that we have to have a constant rate of change. So could you find the rate of change between these two uh, values? Sure, that's no problem. And then use that to find um, the output value for this. Absolutely. Um, so in this example, we're just going to outline the strategy. Um, to find this missing piece, we are going to find the constant rate of change, or yeah, the constant rate of change between these two data points. And we know that it'll be the same constant rate of change between these two data points. Um, and so we'll use that to find the output value of, for x equals 5. You could do that different ways. You could say, oh, I'm just going up one value in my inputs, so I'm just going to go up one constant rate of change in my outputs. Okay, and that one we'll leave there. Our last example in section 2.1 is an example from your um, Canvas your, I'm sorry, your web assign assignment. I wanted us to get started on this one together. Um, uh, just, it's a little bit tricky and I just wanted us to get a, a good footing on it before you started on WebAssign. In 2009, best-selling fiction books in mass market paperback editions sold for about $8. At the same time, best-selling fiction hardcover editions sold for about $27. A reader wanted to spend about $100 on new books in some combination of paperwork back in hardcover editions, construct a function of the number of hardcover books based on the number of paperback editions bought. Okay, um, so lots of words here, lots of uh, data, and we they do want us to come up with a function, so what I'm going to do is create a table and see if I can put any of this information in a table. And so the first thing I have to do is figure out what do I want my input values to be and what do I want my output values to be. And I'll look at this last sentence, construct a function of the number of hardcover books bought based on the number of paperback editions bought. So um, I've seen this terminology before based on, and I know that what comes before is my output. The number of hardcover books is my output. And we'll call the number of hardcover books bought H based on the number of paperback editions bought. So my input should be how many paperback books I bought. So I have a pile of paperback books and a pile of hardcover books that I'm trying to buy, and I know that I only have $100 to spend, and I know the prices of each of these. And I'll call P the number of paperback books that I bought. Um, so I have $100 to spend. 
and I can spend some on paper book backs and some I can spend on hardcover and whatever I spend on paper book backs those cost me um, eight dollars each so however many paperback books I buy times eight dollars plus however many hardcover books I buy and those cost twenty seven dollars each <laughs> that's how I've got that's all the money I have is a hundred dollars so that combination of those two things um, have to equal a hundred dollars Okay, and I can clean it up a little. I don't really need to be writing dollar signs over and over again. But this is um, a function of the number of hardcover books based on the number of paperback books editions bought. So um, I could clean it up a little bit because um, they want to know, you know, an output of H. I could solve this for H. I would subtract 8P and then divide everything by 27. And then I would have H equals um, this formula. I'm going to leave it here. This is a good start. This is number 18 on your 1.6 2.1 homework, but this should give you a start to be able to um, think through this problem and answer the further questions that they ask. Okay, let's think for a minute what we've seen so far in this section. One of the important things that we learned is when we see a constant rate of change, this implies that we're dealing with something called a linear function. And anything with a constant rate of change, when we graph it, it will always have, it, was, it will always be a straight line when we graph it. Importantly, we saw two different forms of lines, the slope intercept form and the point slope form, and um, how you can read off certain information from each one and how you can construct each one based on um, information that you're given. And lastly, we saw the beginnings of a wordy example. Um, so a, a description is of, a, of a real life scenario is given and we have to construct a linear function based on the information that's given. Um, so we'll see a few of those in the, in the homework. As always, remember the resources that you have uh, to get help when you have a question, you can always message me on Canvas. You can use the class discussion board. There's also uh, availability of college tutors. Um, there's a tab for that on your Canvas page for our course.